It's January 30th, 1945, and a 10-year-old boy named Horst Woit is fleeing the war. Germany is losing, and the Russians are coming for revenge. Everyone in East Prussia, North Germany, is ordered to evacuate. Their only hope is to get on board the Wilhelm Gustloff, a ship that will bring them to the safer city of Kiel. Before he leaves with his mother, Horst brings a Swiss army knife with him, just in case. Little did they know, just hours later, they'd find themselves in disaster. The largest loss of life in a single ship sinking in history. The two made it on board the ship. The weather is bitterly cold, and the Soviets could attack at any moment. Horst and his mother even go to sleep wearing life jackets. While sailing along the Baltic Sea, slowly creeping upon them underneath the icy water, is a Soviet submarine. A deafening loud bang is heard on the boat. They have been hit. In a later interview with BBC Witness, Horst Woid recalled the events. My mom woke me up and then the next thing I know, within seconds, uh, another bang and then another bang. We ran out of the cabin and I managed to climb up the stairs and my mom almost made it to the top and fell all the way down and screaming my head off, Mom, 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 you know. And eventually Mom was able to grab the railing and pull herself up. Thankfully, White and his mother made it up to the lifeboats. The only problem was there weren't enough for everyone. There were 22 lifeboats, 11 on each side. But because when the torpedoes hit, the ship took a 15 degrees tip to the uh, port side right away. So no lifeboat got loose on the starboard side, okay? And on the port side, about six or seven got loose. The rest were frozen. So in general, all they got is maybe seven lifeboats. And you can put about 70 people into a lifeboat. Woit and his mother were among the lucky few that got into the lifeboats. As it lowered, people started jumping in. Some people had to be hit over the head with a paddle to stop them from climbing aboard. You know, just gruesome. Those are the things you... They're, they're in your head. You, you can't get rid of it. It's impossible. Then, all of a sudden, there was further panic. The ship was sinking. But the ropes were frozen to the lifeboat. They were going to pull it down with the ship. People frantically searched for someone with a knife. Just when they thought their luck had completely run out, Woit realized that he still had his Swiss Army knife. He was just a 10-year-old boy, but saved 70 people, including himself and his mother. The lifeboat broke from the ship, and the child watched the ocean liner disappear into the Baltic Sea. Estimates say between 7,000 and 9,000 people died. To put it into context, 1,500 people died on the Titanic. It was by far the greatest maritime disaster of all time. So why do we know so little about this tragedy? To answer this, we'll first look at the Guslov's troubled history. It was constructed in 1933 and was initially meant to be named after Adolf Hitler. Hitler had just been appointed as Chancellor of Germany and was incredibly popular. But rather than name the boat after himself, he decided to change it to Wilhelm Gustloff, the leader of a Swiss branch of the Nazi party, who a Jewish student assassinated. Naming the boat after Gustloff helped promote Nazi propaganda, as it made a martyr out of the slain leader and further vilified Jewish people. The Gustloff was built as part of the German government's Kraft durch Freude program, as an ocean cruise liner for German workers to relax and enjoy some leisure time. The cruise first set sail on March 24, 1938, and in a period of 17 months, went on roughly 50 voyages and transported approximately 65,000 vacationers. It could accommodate up to 1,900 people, including about 400 staff. The rooms were all the same size and quality to reflect the socialist ideals of Nazi Germany, where no class structures existed. You also couldn't simply book a ticket on this cruise. The Nazi party chose passengers. There were other functions of the vessel too. On April 10, 1938, 
it operated as a polling place for Germans and Austrians living in England to vote on the annexation of Austria. In May 1939, it was used to bring soldiers of the Condor Legion back to Germany after the Spanish Civil War ended. There was no time for luxury cruises during World War II, and the boat was instead used as a hospital ship in the Baltic Sea and Norway. Then, in 1940, it laid in Dynia, Poland, and operated as a barracks for the 2nd Submarine Training Division. The boat would still be in Poland until 1945, and the fateful day when it went on its final voyage. The evacuation was part of Operation Hannibal, which called for the immediate exodus of East Prussia, West Prussia, and Pomerania. Today, these areas are all part of Northern Germany, Russia, and Poland. It was the German equivalent of the evacuation of Dunkirk, except on a much bigger scale. In fact, 338,000 were evacuated from Dunkirk, whereas over 2 million were evacuated from these regions during this operation. On January 30th, the Guslav initially took on soldiers from the 2nd Submarine Training Division. Then, they began taking on more and more refugees. 7,956 were on board when registration simply stopped. Witnesses say another 2,000 came on after that. Just after noon, the ship left the Dinia Harbor. The Guslav had been lying idle for quite some time, so Captain Friedrich Peterson sailed at a plodding pace, going no faster than 22 kilometers per hour. Ferries from Poland to Germany today travel around 33 kilometers per hour. This did not prove to be a popular choice among the other crew. Commander of the 2nd Submarine Training Division, Wilhelm Zahn, argued that the speed should be increased to 28 kilometers an hour, but was ignored. Zahn argued that going at this speed would be too fast for Soviet submarines to keep up. First Officer Louis Rees also suggested a route that hugged the coastline, but was also ignored. The chosen route was a deep-water route known to be clear of mines. That evening, there was a radio broadcast of what would be Adolf Hitler's last ever address to the people of Germany. Wie schwer auch die Krise im Augenblick sein mag, sie wird durch unseren unabänderlichen Willen, durch unsere Opferbereitschaft und durch unsere Fähigkeiten am Ende trotz alledem gemeistert werden. Wir werden auch diese Not überstehen. Es wird auch in diesem Kampf nicht in Asien siegen, sondern Europa. Und an der Spitze jene Nation, die seit eineinhalb tausend Jahren Europa als Vormacht gegen den Osten vertreten hat und in alle Zukunft vertreten wird, unser großdeutsches Reich, die deutsche Nation. Hitler said, I expect all Germans to fulfill their duty. Every sacrifice demanded must and will be made. The tone in his address was less optimistic, and his words would ring hollow to the people whose lives were now in danger because of his war. At 6 p.m., the captain was given an urgent message. Apparently, a minesweeper convoy was headed its way, and he needed to activate the lights to prevent a collision. However, the Guslov did not meet any minesweepers on its way. None of the radio operators on the ship claimed to have received this message either. Something strange was going on, and the ship was about to find out exactly what. Turning these lights on proved to be fatal. An hour later, at 7 p.m., a Soviet submarine spotted the boat. The Soviet commander, Captain Alexander Marinesco, decided to move between the Guslov and the coast, as an attack from that side was least expected. At 9.16 p.m., three torpedoes hit, each one more devastating than the last. The ship began sinking, something which would take less than an hour to achieve. The sheer volume of people on the boat meant that there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone on board. The ship carried lifeboats for 5,000 people, just over half of the people estimated to be on board. As I mentioned earlier, the boat was now tilted at one side, so there was no access to half of the lifeboats on the starboard side. Additionally, one of the torpedoes hit the crew headquarters, meaning those on board trained to deal with this situation may have already been killed. Soon the attack destroyed the engines, resulting in the ship going into complete darkness. Crewmen tried to seal shut the doors from the damaged part of the hull, which meant that off-duty crew members were trapped inside. Unfortunately, the darkness and lack of crew also meant that many people were at a loss of where to go or what to do. With all these unfortunate scenarios happening one after the other, 
It truly is a miracle that Voight managed to escape and tell the tale. Over 7,000 other people were not so lucky. The aftermath of its sinking has led to its place in forgotten history. Like the Titanic, there was an inquiry, but the government looking into it, Nazi Germany, would soon be gone. Captain Friedrich Peterson survived but died shortly after the war. Commander Zahn also survived and had to testify before a naval board of inquiry. However, Nazi Germany had collapsed before the authorities could decide whether Zahn was culpable for the crash. Although it was a cruise ship, the boat contained military equipment and personnel, so international associations did not consider this attack a war crime. So why had this tragedy been largely forgotten? There are several reasons behind its obscurity, and this ship leaves a long and complicated legacy in both Germany and the wider world. The most obvious reason is that the boat sunk during World War II, a time when thousands and thousands of people were dying all over Europe. The Titanic was an isolated incident that occurred during peacetime. Three other German vessels, General von Steuben, the Goya, and the Cap Arcona, all sank in the Baltic Sea during Operation Hannibal. Another key reason was that both sides were reluctant to report the ship's sinking. The Germans didn't want anyone to know that the Russians had just killed 9,000 people, as it would be a devastating blow to the country's spirit. Novelist Ruta Sapetis, who researched this tragedy for her novel Told Time magazine, they were amidst an evacuation, and they didn't want it to affect morale. They were also trying to hide the fact that they were losing the war. The Russian side was also reluctant to be celebratory either. This attack wasn't the same as taking down a wartime ship and the majority of people on board the vessel were refugees. There were women, children, and elderly people on the boat, and the attack looked unnecessarily brutal in hindsight. Additionally, the proposed hero behind the attack was naval officer Alexander Marinesco. At the time, he was facing a court-martial due to alcohol problems. He was not someone the Soviet Union wanted to elevate to hero status, despite being one of their most successful ever military officers. Since the end of the Second World War, Germans have been hesitant about mourning their fellow countrymen and countrywomen who fell during World War II, particularly in light of what happened during the Holocaust. According to the novelist, When I've spoken to German people, German historians, academics, readers, and my publisher, they have said that they feel it's inappropriate to ever position themselves as victims, considering the atrocities that they committed during the war. So that was one reason the German regime wasn't talking about it. The German journalist Harald Jener has also spoken about this reluctance to mourn the fallen in relation to other events during World War II. He told the LA Times, Germans have for years avoided talking about the exiles and other aspects of wartime history in which they were the victims. Look at the bombing of Dresden by U.S. warplanes during World War II, which was really an assault on the civilian population. It has gotten only scant attention over the years despite the massive destruction and loss of life. But Wilhelm Gustloff is slightly different. Even if we put this debate to one side, there were not just Germans on that boat. There were also people from countries Hitler had invaded. There were Prussians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Poles, Estonians, and Croatians, all of which had little or nothing to do with Hitler's rise to power. And if we take Horst Voigt, who was just 10 years old when he got on board the ship, should his story still be told? And should we still remember the many children whose lives were cut short on that faithful day? Clearly, the legacy of Nazi Germany is something we are still struggling to grapple with to this day. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. Please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.